I'm so excited to welcome you all to Happy Go Lucky at Heart podcast. I have a mission to support others with undiagnosed autism to get a diagnosis because my mum fought a long battle. But please don't go because this podcast is for absolutely everybody, especially mental health too. And I mean everybody because I will share with you lots of unique yet personal stories from all age groups. So please meet your host, Vicky Kidson, otherwise known as me. Buckle up because it's going to be a long mission. So enjoy and live life to the full. Please give Jo Hazel Watkins some love. She is a trauma-informed personal trainer from Osher Street, North Shropshire, helping people with PTSD. So I hope you enjoy this episode. I think so- I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what you do and your mission. Oh, my mission. So I'm a personal trainer. So I work in a gym, two gyms, actually. I teach strength classes. So exercise classes in, you know, becoming stronger and fitter. And then I also do one-to-one. So PT sessions with people one-to-one. So my mission, bit of a story, but I'll tell you. (laughs) My mission has come from my own experience, which was using strength training to recover from mental health breakdown. And I use it to manage PTSD symptoms as well so I'm fairly free of those now but occasionally you know like these things so it comes up but um I have learned by doing so my mission now is to be someone who can help people who maybe wouldn't normally go to the gym but help them access this amazing thing of using barbells and dumbbells and strength training like you've done to sort of help manage your mental health because I believe we need a full sort of toolkit don't we like medication rest good food most trauma therapy doesn't work sometimes for people oh really yeah I think and everyone's so different aren't they and everyone has a different experience that it's trying to find a cocktail that works for you isn't it like a a good mixture of things that add up to Jager bomb (laughs) yeah (laughs) might well yeah it depends what you're into but um yeah so that that's my mission is to sort of bring it to people who just might not have considered it and they might be you know might have gone to a GP or be sat like I was on waiting list for treatment really really not very well and not knowing that you can access this method of moving your body and and learning about how your body works and it can actually really 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 significantly improve the way you feel and it's instant you know you you leave the gym feeling better than you did when you walked in most of the time I sleep Um, so much better as well yeah it's Mm -hmm. incredible isn't it and and we're sort of not really we all know that you know exercise is good for us and when you go to the gp or the doctor or wherever you know exercise go and get some exercise but what does that what does that really mean like you know if you've never done any form of exercise before or you don't know how to what to do when you get to a gym then how do you do it so i love being able to work with people who have never stepped foot inside a gym and say come on you can do it let's get cracking yeah that's my mission (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> what is trauma informed personal training so trauma informed personal training is so the way i see it is we all experience the world differently based on who we yeah, are what we've, and especially what we've been through in life um so trauma informed means and it, and this is specific to a gym environment but i ha- have done some training about how best to sort of help somebody be able to complete exercises or engage in exercise with knowledge about their background a little bit you know I, I don't have to know everything but it's a way of having a conversation about how can we make this experience better for you particularly if people have got you know certain triggers that they might have it, whether it's you know their physical space or whether it's um i don't know loud noises or you know whatever it might be for people yeah it's all different isn't it? everyone everyone is so different and it could even be something you can't quite put your finger on but it's it's just about the trauma-informed approach is about really really understanding what the person needs to be able to get through the exercise and I think unfortunately in fitness and in you know classes and things they work for a lot of people but I think for people who have been through trauma or experiencing mental health difficulties that isn't an easy thing to do if you can work with someone who has knowledge about trauma and how it affects us you can just bridge that gap and help people access it and also understand how it might manifest in the body so you know I have people that I work with and they might dissociate completely in in the middle of a session so it's knowing okay that's happened because of this how can we come out of it and we will have had at some point a very lengthy conversation about how can I help you get out from that state you know what can we do to bring you back that approach really of just knowing the person and what they need to get through the the 45 minute workout and enjoy it 
and not leave feeling like they've failed or you know whatever it might be so yeah that's the way I work what's your understanding and training oh so my understanding of it is sort of two-pronged I have the understanding which is my own personal experience of how I got through this process and the other side is the professional training I've had so um, I'm a personal trainer which means I've done level two and level three which is the sort of standard gym instructor and then personal training qualifications I also train to be an exercise on referral practitioner which means I have a bit more specific knowledge about medications or certain conditions and because my interest is mental health conditions it's specific to those so the referral does the NHS pay or no sadly not there's there's no funding for this which is it's a whole other thing I could rant about (laughs) but you know when you it's just a real shame that you can't get exercise on prescription it's free it's in our bodies we have this ability to release the chemicals and the hormones in our bodies by exercising but yet what tends to happen is you are sent down the medication route which is really important in a lot of cases and also the therapy route but currently there isn't funding for it there used to be I think that you know various councils used to offer you know a sort of 10 week pass or something to a gym a a council run gym but the problem with that is often maybe there isn't someone there who's had the level of training that you need to work with people who've been through some really difficult things and this is another part of my mission (laughs) my my life I like the word mission I'm going to use the word mission Um, just try and sort that out somehow try and create a space where people can access it make it access for all yeah exactly and that's why I tend to do a lot more classes because they're cheaper you know personal training one-to-one it isn't cheap you know for a lot of people Um, but what you're getting for that is expertise it is tricky I'm currently working on a project actually which should be launching quite soon about being able to fund people through exercise for their mental health so more information about that soon but I'll let me know and I'll post it on my story oh thank you yeah that'd be great (laughs) how do you stay knowledgeable on the latest updates to the sector Well, so the people who I trained with, my trauma-informed weightlifting training was with an organisation in America called the JRI Institute, and they are the Centre for Embodiment and Trauma. So they do a lot of studies into trauma recovery. And What does um, it stand for? It's the JRI Institute, Justice Resource Institute in Boston, in America. This was over lockdown. I did their Zoom. I was the only one in the UK. It was like (laughs) four o'clock in the morning here, and they're all in the daylight doing their training, and I stayed up all night to do it with them but it was fascinating and that was all about how trauma affects your brain and then how weightlifting can help so that's how I stay I stay in consultation with them so about once a month or every, we have a we have a group online where we can talk through cases and and just stay in the loop basically about what's what's happening so and I read a lot of books about all these things <laughs> what's included in your training in my training as in if you were to do personal training with me yeah the first thing we would do is we would have a, just a chat about what it is that you need what it is that you find difficult we would I have an intake form that you would fill in and that's completely confidential and it would be you would then have the opportunity to highlight anything that you might find difficult it's then from that we would have our first session which is usually 45 minutes to an hour depending on how how you feel and we just go through the basics so find out how you move what's tricky for you what isn't tricky for you what feels good what doesn't feel good and then depending on goals you know everybody has a different goal I would build a program around that and we would meet however often you needed to meet once a week twice a week for a session and then in between we'd have a little motivational sort of chat on whatsapp or whatever messaging and um keep going oh cool what's your cancellation policy oh so it depends what you're doing if you're doing it totally depends on how people want to pay but usually if i was doing one-to-one sessions people book in blocks so they might book a block for a month and all i ask is that i'm just given as much notice as possible if you need to cancel so usually 48 hours is the minimum because I would have had to have booked a gym to work in and that's the other thing to say is that usually when I work with people I do it in a private space you know there aren't onlookers there's not people walking around it's no distractions yeah exactly and you know a lot of people don't like exercising by mirrors so I tend to work in places you know we don't have mirrors or onlookers (laughs) so it's just hate mirrors exactly (laughs) although it's useful when I'm horse riding because in the last in Herefordshire there was when I was horse riding they had mirrors to see your posture when you're riding I yeah. found that useful but at the gym it's totally yeah. no. <laughs> and they you know they do have their place I mean but you get to that in your own good time I think asking someone who's maybe never exercised before and isn't used to seeing themselves sweaty and <laughs> you know wearing a baggy t-shirt or whatever then it can be quite inhibiting and, and I'd rather people felt completely comfortable without you know feeling worried about how they looked in a mirror because that yeah, that's understandable yeah how long does process take 
how long is a piece of string? <laughs> yeah, I suppose <laughs> it's different in everyone. It is. I mean, it depends. It depends, really, because if you were looking for something to make you feel better instantly in terms of your mood, then that will be achieved in one hour, you know, or less, because it only takes about 15 to 20 minutes of moving your body for the all the good stuff to start being released and for the endorphins to kick in. So there's that. But if you had a longer term goal, like, I don't know, you wanted to be able to lift a certain amount of weight, or if people are looking for weight loss, then that's totally dependent on lots of different factors so that process is dependent on yeah what people's goals are yeah I definitely notice my stamina's improve when I'm horse riding I mean you work hard in the gym Vicky like yeah. you know, you're not a slacker <laughs> Do you have a nutritional background? No, I think I've done some nutrition training with my qualifications. So you you do a module and an exam on nutrition. I was lucky enough that in my upbringing, my mum's a nurse and she's a very healthy person. So I had a lot of education from her about food. But I've also, I'm just naturally interested in it anyway, but I'm not a nutritionist. I can talk to you about food and in our training, we would, it's very, very important that you eat the right things, particularly, well, with everything. I mean, we should all eat a good, healthy, balanced diet. One thing I find interesting is uh, Sioux Pharmacy. Oh, Sioux Ph- what's that? Sioux- so it's basically when an animal treats themselves, knows what to have to make them feel better. So oh, they yes. know what to have. Like my horse used to have cleavers and okay. it's like a liver Kleenex and she used to have sarcoids. So that improved them. So they know oh, wow. what makes them feel better. Oh, amazing. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, it makes sense as well, doesn't it? Your body knows what it needs, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Will someone need any supplements or equipment before they start? No. So supplements wise, I mean, not the kind of supplements of, you know, big, massive jars of capsules and things like that. I mean, if you've had a mineral deficiency, maybe you would go to the GP and have tests and that's a whole other thing. But to start exercising, no, you just need to come in, make sure you've had something to eat, you know, just get on with it. No equipment, nothing. You've got your body that's all you need what are your personal fitness goals (laughs) oh so at the moment my goal is just to build my upper body strength more so I love pull strength so I'm I'm I just like I was saying earlier I'm trying out climbing bouldering I set myself various different goals like I had a real burning desire to do massive deadlifts before I turned 40 so I did that (laughs) got to 40 and went right what's next so now it's um you know, being able to pull my body weight up. So I, but I just, I love the feeling of being strong and capable. So I just do whatever feels good to me. I don't particularly follow a specific training program. I just know what I need on the day and I'll, I'll do that and work to my maximum effort. Really. I love, I love being challenged. So yeah. Yeah. Likewise. <laughs> getting strong, Vicky. Yeah. Really strong. <laughs> What if someone doesn't see results? Oh, so if someone didn't see results, we would, obviously this again, depends on what their goal is. So if it was that they weren't particularly increasing in their strength, then we would have to look at, okay, so what's going on outside the gym? Are you eating the right things? Are you eating enough? Are you, Are you eating... eating enough protein? Exactly. And, and you know, just making sure you're getting those rests and that you're not really exhausted and all the, you know, what's happening on the, the times. And also the, the same would apply if someone was trying to lose weight or, you know, and then and then there's a whole nuances of if someone wasn't feeling better in themselves, then we would have to probably revisit what their goals were and sort of find out what's happening again, probably outside the gym and maybe change the exercise accordingly. It's a, it's a, a big question, but again, goes back to the person's goals and and general habits around exercise as well food it's always food and sleep food sleep exercise definitely work sleep play repeat yeah, exactly yeah exactly. do you take before and after photos I don't know that's good I, it's not that I don't agree with it but in my personal professional practice that isn't something I would automatically do or ask people to do I would never put someone in the position to do that because I think there's a lot of that in fitness and it's incredibly off-putting for a lot of people and it's very very problematic if I mean having said that if people want to take their own photos at home in the privacy of their own home and it's for their own record that's totally fine and that's up to them you know good you know great if that makes you feel better about yourself but I'm not into putting before and afters on the internet of people because I I don't it's not that's not the way I'm working and also it isn't a true measure of someone's improvement because you might have physically changed your body but have you changed your mindset is your 
relationship with exercise healthy are you managing to get enough rest like none of those things are going to be shown in a yeah. before and after in your pants I read some articles and it said basically skinny is back in on social Ugh, I've seen those oh god yeah oh god yeah who decides these things anyway it's ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> it's pathetic but um using it for your own personal journals is a good thing because then yeah and it's about being really mindful in that process as well and, and thinking yeah. well, why why am I doing this if it makes you feel good to take those photos and have them go for it but if it makes you feel rubbish don't do it you know just don't track that track something else track your mood track how delicious your food is because you're nourishing your body properly you know there's other ways of, of tracking these things is mindfulness added on to your training as well well I think I would say that I go about everything with a fairly mindful approach I want people to be present in what they're doing because that's the beauty of it as well particularly with if you're someone who struggles with anxiety or in my case, you know, with the PTSD symptoms I was having, you know, and as you know, PTSD takes you back to the past all the time. You're like constantly yeah. removed from the present. Or the future. Or the future. So the beauty of learning how to lift, let's say, let's do a dead, you know, let's say we did a deadlift or something and it's heavy, then you have to tune into where your body is. And particularly when you're being coached and I'm saying something to you like, okay, where are your feet? Feel the ground under your feet. It's it's about grounding you into the movement that you're about to do. And you see a lot of people in gyms and they are and focus on your breathing exactly be in your body don't be somewhere else that is hard for a lot of people and that's part of the trauma-informed approach as well is understanding how someone also can be incredibly uncomfortable in their own body and how do you help connect them back together yeah so, what's interest you about trauma-informed pt it's fascinating it's just the most logical way of going about life <laughs> yeah <laughs> like you know if you is it rewarding oh I love yeah it's the most rewarding thing I've ever done I love it because you know I do work with some people who are really you know have really really struggled and been on their knees you know in life we have a session and it's you see this magical moment happen where the facial expression changes and switches and you can see this release or this like pure moment of joy or satisfaction or like contentment and stillness in their body because they've been able to do something that they didn't think they could do you know I love the fact that I'm able to sort of help people engage in exercise who maybe wouldn't have done they would have thought the gym is for big muscly people who walk around in tiny pants and not tiny pants but <laughs> you know tiny shorts and, and it's that isn't the case that's some people you know it's for all of us that's amazing what are your career goals my career goals um so I have a fairly big one at the moment, which is um, this project that I'm about to launch with a, a friend and, and colleague now, which is combining strength training with space for sort of um, mental health support. You know, I often find as well that in PT sessions, there's the distraction of movement and it helps people talk. You know, people want to tell you, oh, you know, this is difficult for me because of this or it's not therapy, but it's therapeutic having a bit of movement going on and you end up relaxing and you end up talking so this project that I'm launching with a friend called Soma Dynamic is combining those two things and I'd love to make that something that is you know we'd love to turn it into a CIC one day and get funding so that we can bring people off waiting lists or you know not off waiting lists but you know while they're waiting for therapies come and do strength training but have this community mental health support as not community mental health support, you know what I mean, the community of the fitness space and develop that practice to, to help themselves, you know, without having to wait for external things to happen in the system. That's brilliant. How long have you been a trainer? I have been a trainer for, uh, oh, hang on, four years, three, four years. It was a gradual process because I was getting better. So I did my training quite slowly in the beginning. In the last three years, I've sort of done the majority of my training and accelerated it really. What was yeah. your previous job, if you don't mind me asking? No, I well, I have <laughs> my degree I had is actually textiles, knitwear. So yeah. I, I wrote knitting patterns. <laughs> Would you believe? And it, I've always done sort of creative business startups, things like that. So um yeah, completely different, not sporty in the slightest. I love creative things. Yeah. It's still part of it as well. I, I do love yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. I think sport is quite creative. Like, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Does anybody or you get overwhelmed with your PT? I work with people in, in a very close way that ideally they wouldn't find the training that I'm doing with them overwhelming as such because I make sure that we have a constant communication going on about they're in control you know they can stop at any time I'm not one of these PTs who's going to be like right you can't go home till you've done like 50 burpees or I don't do anything like that it's very much I hate burpees yeah I don't like burpees either <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what when I um 
qualified on the first course I did I was like I am never going to program a burpee <laughs> so there was many other ways to move than a, than that yes yeah, so and then overwhelm that has happened you know if people are experiencing difficult things then you know there are moments where they hit a point of overwhelm and we just work around it we will have had a conversation about how to ground them back down into the room and we work with that when it happens so it does happen you know and it's inevitable because you're working with difficult things so you know I have I don't think I've ever found myself getting overwhelmed but I definitely work incredibly hard in those sessions and have a little rest need to have a cup of tea and lie down after (laughs) no it's not that bad but yeah there have been times when it's you know it's intense so how do you resolve the overwhelmness so when that happens because of the conversations we will have had at the beginning and the forms that are filled in these forms about what people have experienced that there are questions of how can I help you if this situation comes up so everyone is different so some people will have something they bring with them and that helps ground them or other people will have visualization sort of techniques that they want to do so as long as I know those things we can we can work with it and we just wind it right back like I do in doing the five technique where you do something you see five times yeah do something you hear yeah four times yeah and so on like feel like all your senses exactly yeah. there's lots of different techniques that we can use to bring someone back down and you know I want people to feel safe in the gym with me and I think a lot of the time gyms can feel very very confronting you know that's why it's really important that we have a very good conversation at the beginning about what it is people need in, in that session which is more important to you physical fitness or nutrition Oh, they they are so linked. Well, they are like, <laughs> aren't they? Yeah, they are. I think it, it's um. I wouldn't say it's something about being more important, but I I think it's important to understand the benefit of both. We all need to move every day. You know, sitting at a desk every day and then lying on your sofa at night is no good for anyone. But equally, you know, eating is you know it, our bodies are very primal things. They need certain nutrients, and if you're not giving your body those things, then you won't see the benefit of exercise. So it's just a it's a, a little loop that goes round. And it's the same with sleep, like we were saying, and play and fun. And, like, you know, there's there's lots of things, but one is not more important with the other. It's about finding the balance that works for you with both. Yeah. I have to be careful with pushing myself too hard and nutrition because of yeah. my seizures. So, yeah, exactly. Think- and, and that's that's a good point, actually, because everybody will have, you know, different conditions to manage and different things that they maybe they're sensitive to with food. So it's about learning. Again, it's, it always goes back to about learning what you need as an individual, not what the Internet might be telling you you think you need. How do you keep motivation up for your clients? Well, depends on the person. I think motivation, you know, it's making sure the, the sessions are achievable for the person you know, and within their capability. We also, again, when we have our initial chat and form filling sessions, we talk about what helps motivate people. So some people, it might be that they need to have a really good playlist on while they're yeah. exercising and have loud music. Like I, I cannot exercise without I have to have music playlist. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> and or like, podcasts. Okay. Yeah, that's it. To sort of work with that way. Other people is they might need quite hands on, not hands on, but like lots of verbal me there going, come on, get up. You know, lots of people respond to that. Other people just want to be left alone. And, you know, r- always recognising how far they've come in the sessions. You know, you will have seen this at the the groups that you come to where we always celebrate whatever people have managed to do and make sure that the environment is supportive and friendly. And that in itself is motivating because it makes you want to come back. If you go, you know, if you go into a PT session or a class and you come out feeling broken because they've made you do something that you're not ready to do, then you're not going to go back, are you? So, no. No. How do past experiences affect a person's current situation? Oh, that's a big one, isn't it? <laughs> My experiences are quite frantic and stoic. Yeah, so again, we're, we're all kind of products of our environment, aren't we? And, and influences that have, you know, and it could be that someone has, you know, incredibly low self-belief. They don't think that they can achieve these things. And then that's a lovely thing to be able to work with in a gym because you can say, no, come on, you can. And you show them that they're capable of doing a really simple thing and then that develops up into a bigger picture equally you know someone might have been affected by a traumatic injury to their body like I've worked with a lot of people who've had life-changing injuries to their body so that has a huge impact on how they feel doing exercise and you know having a very sort of disconnected relationship with their body so again everyone is so different everyone's story is different but there's always a way of finding work with them okay great 
Describe a conversation with one of your clients. Oh, what, uh, what, so as in like an intake sort of first yeah. meeting? Yeah, so we would have a chat about, you know, what it is that they're looking for. I do find that often people who come to me for PT are people who've been recommended word of mouth. Someone will say, oh, you know, you should go and have a chat with Jo because she's this kind of person. Because I tend to work with people who are recovering from something, we have a conversation about maybe what's happened not not what's happened in terms of details but where are they in terms of emotionally feeling about the gym or what is it they want to feel when they come in do they want to I don't know have a mood lift or do they want to feel physically stronger like we'll have a chat about that and then I just encourage them to come along and and even just watch you know they don't even have to join in on the first session they could come and do 10 minutes they can come and do the whole thing they can you know just be approachable just be friendly just have a chat and if you can work together then great and I find that most people do they come back and they keep coming back which is good <laughs> very yeah. relaxed approach I think I'm, you know I don't want to ever make people feel like they failed at something and I think with fitness and especially the rise of like online workouts and all this stuff there's a lot of pressure to perform a certain way and we seem to be missing how does it actually just make you feel It should make you feel good. It shouldn't feel like a punishment because you ate a Mars bar. You know, there's a healthier way of looking at it. What are your strategies for building affinity with clients or potential clients? Having a relaxed approach? Yeah, I think I'm a fairly calm person anyway. Like, I feel like I am. I feel like I... And also the most important thing is that I remember what that was like to be incredibly low and going into... I was so anxious when I used to go into these gym classes and felt completely disconnected from myself and I remember what that was like so I just apply that to every person that walks in and think what did I need in that moment you need someone to be friendly and welcoming and understand where you are not expect you just to go in at 10 out of 10 effort and you know it's it's that sort of thing so and then I'll just find out about them you know talk to them as a human just relate on a human level not see them as a product or a booking that's come in and paid you some money it's like no this person's come to you because they need something work with it and make it accessible to them yeah tell me a success story oh well it depends really so success story is so I guess actually the lovely success story of I've I've got a couple of people I work with who've had who have got you know fairly dramatic PTSD symptoms that affect them and there's both of them have made significant improvements They're, they're doing other work as well I'm not putting this solely on the fact that they come and do strength training but they've really managed to minimize their symptoms well there's lots of sort of different versions of success stories I think I do work with a couple of people who at the moment who have really really progressed in terms of strength but also the way that they feel in themselves you know that people who have who experience really really quite difficult symptoms to do with their PTSD and effects of that throughout their day throughout their week doing strength training and sort of being in the gym and having a little bit of a chat about it but sort of learning to use exercise to manage sensations in the body so whether it's how your anxiety stores or how your stress stores and showing people different ways of expressing that you know there are people that are, you know, and it's an ongoing process so the success hopefully will just keep coming as they manage to integrate exercise into their well-being sort of package if you like you know we were talking about the holistic sort of approach of lots of different elements so that's been really good and and I think also the success stories of just seeing people come back week on week on week I mean the group that we we do at Zest you know the women's one that you come to that started with I don't know three or four people oh and now wow it's it's so busy just huge like it's great it's so busy and I love it and I love the atmosphere and you know we've just started doing an extra session as well because that to me is a success story it's whether they can all do I don't know handstands and backflips and <laughs> <laughs> you know walking around with six packs that's nothing to do with it it's um the fact that they all everybody who comes keeps coming back and that means that they've successfully integrated it into their you know weekly routine of looking after themselves and their bodies so that to me is a success story yeah definitely you know and also my own I I feel like I've been given this whole new career and way of through doing this process and that to me is a success story after you know years and years and years of struggling and now it's like ah. Oh, this is me. This is like this incredible sense of calm I've got from this, you know, this way of learning how my body works and how to move it properly and lots of little different successes. Yeah. How do you track a client's progress? So again, it would depend on what their goal is. So usually people, they want to work with me about building strength and confidence in the gym. So that's very easy to track. And that's the beauty of strength training is you can measure it in kilograms. 
on you know how big is this thing you're picking up it's not all about just lifting heavier and harder all the time that's a progression to show but it's also about moving better and moving more comfortably in your body whether it's your flexibility has also improved because we've, we've done like some... working on your form yeah exactly learn and understanding where these muscles are and where your hips have to go and you know and it's really going back to that word mindful again is it's tuning in with which bit connects to which and how do I get that bit over there and you know for example the hinge form for a deadlift you know that's often a really difficult one for people to understand what has to happen yeah so success and progression can be measured in lots of different ways but I think for most people it's the fact that they they believe that they won't be able to pick that barbell up until I point out well it probably weighs the same as your weekly shop that you've just done when you carry a big carrier bag in each hand and then they're like oh oh and they do it and then they find they can add more and add more and then you see people starting to like oh you know it's that lovely sense of accomplishment and achievement yeah what's the feedback the feedback is good I I think feedback often it's verbal feedback like people say oh yeah it was a great workout or oh it feels really good to be able to do that and I, I think also the feedback for me represents itself in word of mouth that people will bring their friends to sessions or I'll get an email from someone who says there's like bad karma but there's also good karma yeah yes we love a bit of good karma <laughs> And I think people also just fitness and, and weight training, you know, all the, all this different, different ways of training your body. There's a lot of pressure to be able to do it a certain way. And I think what I feel I want to do is be able to just offer people an opportunity to have a go. And you don't have to look a certain way. You don't have to wear fancy stuff. You don't have to wear full face of makeup and put your hair in a fancy whatever. You know, you can just come and have a go. And that in itself is is really lovely. And the feedback being that the people, you know, again, they just they come back it's- week on week and... Enjoy I it. feeling just going away and just feeling empowered yeah and I remember you when you came to that first session and I will never forget that at the end you said how many times a week can I come and do this <laughs> and I was like yes Vicky <laughs> that's, what, that's how everyone should feel you know you shouldn't yeah. feel leave feeling exhausted and depleted and broken like that's maybe later if you chase that kind of feeling but not in the beginning It needs to feel achievable. How do you create a safe environment? In terms of emotional safety, it would be making sure you know in a one-to-one session, that's much easier because you know that person's presentation, you know maybe what's going on for them outside the gym a little bit. I don't know everything. I don't need to know everything. So we would just work around it. And again, it's about constant communication. If they feel safer with the door shut, we shut the door. If they feel safer with loud music on and it's or their positioning in the gym has to be a certain way it, there's so many little bits that you can do in groups it's a bit more of a management thing of just making sure that it doesn't get too busy that you're able to offer each person attention when they need it and working with it that way really how do you cope being exposed to others who have gone through trauma that is a very important question I cope I have a setup of supervision so I have group supervision with people I've trained with in the US where that's a really good place where it's confidential and we can talk about things we've we've experienced in the gym with people um I also have one-to-one supervision with someone who I can go and if I've you know if I've been talked to or had a conversation with someone that's very difficult then I can take that somewhere else and because everything is confidential I have to be able to go and put it somewhere so I have my own supervision and that keeps me emotionally safe and that's a really important part of what I do especially with the nature of the work that I want to do more of which is working with people recovering from trauma that's that sort of outside scaffolding for me is really important I'm glad what's your understanding on mind and body connection well it's all linked isn't it Every, that's what yeah. we just should know it's just it's just linked I mean I'm not a scientist or an, you know but I I know through doing and through watching other people do it that if you can Learn how to engage with your body as a machine that needs maintenance um, to keep you healthy, then it just helps everything. You know, you're less likely to develop all sorts of illnesses and conditions, but also it keeps your mind healthy. You know, just the endorphins or being with other people, having a connection with other people or feeling capable. There's so much to it. And that's why there are millions of books about this. But yeah, that they are, in, you know, intrinsically linked. You can't, you can't separate the two. You can't have a healthy mind without a healthy body and you can't have a yeah. healthy body without a healthy mind. <laughs> Happy mind, happy body, happy life. 
Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. What's your holistic approach you take to your own well-being and hope to help others understand? When during my own recovery, I sort of found that I needed to develop by doing these kind of different elements of this, yeah, holistic approach. So it's it's about your whole life. And I, for example, the first thing I started doing was swimming outdoors in cold water. Yeah. And I and I went yesterday. So this is my fifth winter swimming, which I love. I get really excited this time of year because I get such a buzz from it. So there's that. I make sure that I have a lot of time resting and being quiet. I'm quite introvert, so I need like a lot of quiet time because the work I'm doing, I'm putting so much out of me that I need to then kind of restore the balance (laughs) by having quiet, quiet times. Um, I have very rigid kind of eating and sleeping system. Not rigid, but I just really stick to a routine. And that yeah, I stick to a routine as well. Yeah, because mm-hmm. I've just learned the wrong way of pushing too hard in either direction of not, you know, not looking after yourself, really. But I work pretty hard to look after myself ongoing because I, you know, I know what it feels like to be as unwell as I was. And I don't want to ever go there again. Thanks very much. I will do whatever it takes to sort of keep myself well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And to finish off, I always finish off with some silly questions. So beat your mountains and why? Oh, what is this to go and visit or be in? Um, uh, whatever mountains definitely mountains. i like both to be honest because by the sea and then yeah being up high having a power up view yeah, exactly the best in that if you like the both then there's that uh, lovely harlech beach in snowdonia <laughs> where you can stand on the beach and see the mountains that's a good yeah one. there you go ticks both boxes that one <laughs> crunchy or smooth peanut butter crunchy crunchy <laughs> <laughs> yeah Early morning lark or night owl? Well, so actually I've gone from one to the other. I used to be a night owl and refused to go to bed before it was like one o'clock in the morning. But as I've got older and had children and now have to get them up and go to school, <laughs> go to work, I'm definitely a morning morning person. I'm a night owl. Are you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I used to be, not anymore. <laughs> But I like, I'm kind of a mid hair as well because I like the afternoon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I like, I like the mornings, particularly if I'm going for a, my favorite time to swim is sunrise. So winter, first thing in the morning, going, you know, swimming in the lake. That's an amazing time to go. Yeah. Thank you. That's all right. Thank you, Joe. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you for Lizzie. having me, having you on my podcast. That's, That's right. And to have been asked. So thank you. Bye. <laughs> bye bye, Vicky. Ah, yet another wonderful interview. Much obliged for you to stay and listen to Happy Go Lucky at Heart podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please keep on boasting about it to to your friends and family. And if you have any spare time, please help an independent podcaster get known. So please leave a five-star review on whichever podcast platform you listen on and click the link in the show notes for many more ways to connect with me. Bye. Mwah.